we know is at all time highs. And now here we are after the elections. And many people think, well, maybe the economy is fixed. Maybe everything is fine. Maybe we don't have to worry. In your opinion and all your research and everything that you looked at, is the economy okay now? Oh, definitely, definitely not. In fact, our long-term problems have gotten even worse. But if you look at it, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, especially Democrats may think, well, Barack Obama did a pretty good job. But when you look at it, he's actually going to be the only president, the only president in all of U.S. history to never have a single year when U.S. GDP grew by at least 3%. And now remember, he's had two terms. So he's had eight years to try to get this done, but not a single year. Every other president, even back during the Great Depression, you know, they had down years, but then they would have up years too. And every single president throughout U.S. history has had at least one year when the economy grew by at least 3%. So we've been in this stagnation period for a while. And, but, but, it's not been stagnation for everyone. You know, the, for example, the people at the very top, they've been doing quite well with the stock market rising, thanks to the Federal Reserve, pumping it up with funny money, the manipulation. So the people at the very top have been doing well. Meanwhile, people in the middle class and at the lower end of the scale have not been doing so well. You know, for example, you look at, uh, you know, there was a survey taken last year, found that 62% of all Americans had less than $1,000 in savings. And then they took the survey again, just here recently this year, and they discovered that number had jumped up from 62% to 69% of all Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. And so what that means is essentially about two thirds of the country is living paycheck to paycheck without a cushion to fall back on. And so that's uh, that's a major concern. You know, we've seen credit card delinquencies. They just hit the highest level that we've seen since 2012 in four years. So people are getting behind on their credit card payments. We're seeing uh, corporations, they're, they're behind on their debts at the highest level since the last financial crisis. We've got CNN has reported that 35% of all Americans have a debt that is at least 180 days past due. So approximately a third of all Americans can't pay all their debts. We've got the rate of home ownership, which is kind of a sign of, of, you know, how the middle class is doing. Well, that's fallen for eight years in a row and is now hovering near a 50 year low in terms of the percentage of the country that uh, owns a home. You know, we've got poverty exploding. In fact, you know, New York City, right where Wall Street is from, where Donald Trump is from, is one of the areas which has been doing better than the rest of the country. Well, the number of people in home, the, the, the number of homeless people in New York City just hit a brand new record high. And so we've got all these, even in this time of, of when things have been fairly steady, the economy's not really been growing, but, uh, you know, things have been relatively stable. Uh, somewhat, and we can talk about why that is, and I've got some very strong opinions on that. But even during this time of, of relative stability, Dave, we've got poverty exploding, we've got struggles for the middle class, things are getting harder for ordinary Americans, and we haven't even gotten into the midst of the, of the n next great crisis yet. You mentioned, you know, why you think this is stable. Uh, what's your view on this? Why do you think the economy is stable throughout this eight years? Yeah. When people say, well, how has Barack Obama stabilized things? Why, why, why aren't we in the middle of a rip-roaring depression right now? Well, the number one factor, and no one ever really talks about this, but the number one factor is debt. And let me give you an example from real life. If you went out today and you went, uh, you know, to a big box store and pulled out your credit card and you could buy a big 70 inch television, bring it home. And then if you could go out and you could go to a car dealership and, and, you know, get the most expensive car you're approved for and go on vacations and, you know, apply for a bunch more credit cards and, and spend money for a while, you could live like a millionaire, but eventually a day of reckoning comes. But for the moment, what you're doing by going into debt, you're bringing future consumption into the present and raising your standard of living. And as a nation, that's what we've been doing. You know, for example, total household debt in the United States at this point is up to $12.3 trillion. The total amount of corporate debt since the last financial crisis has approximately doubled the greatest corporate debt binge in history. But in per, the biggest of all, of course, is the U.S. national debt. When Barack Obama entered the White House, our national debt was setting at $10.6 trillion. 
today is sitting at $19.84 trillion, just shy of $20 trillion. So more than $9 trillion, what the federal government has done is taken $9 trillion from our children, our grandchildren, future generations of Americans, stolen all that money, which breaks down to more than $100 million an hour, every single hour of every single day since Barack Obama entered the White House, taken all that money from future consumption, brought it into the present to make the economy look better now. Because when the government spends money, well, that you know that then that and, you know goes to pay government contractors. It goes to you know pay researchers. It goes to it, as transfer payments into the pockets of Americans who go out and spend it in the stores. So government spending, without a doubt, stimulates the economy. But so much of the spending is taken consumption from the future through the through debt, bringing it into the present, making the present look better. Because without all that debt that we've gotten into. We would, without a doubt, we would be in a horrible economic depression right now. But Barack Obama has essentially cheated and cheated the future because future generations of Americans are going to have to pay back more money than we borrowed because of interest. So he's cheating the future and destroying the future because that's what debt does. It destroys the future to make the present look better. So without all this debt, I wouldn't even want to imagine what our economy would look like. But of course, when you go into all that debt, a day of reckoning comes eventually. From all your data and your research and looking at all these different economic indicators, do you think that we're in a recession right now? Well, John Williams of ShadowStats.com uh, is convinced. You know, he tracks the numbers and he tracks what they would look like if honest numbers were actually being used. And according to his numbers, GDP has been shrinking by and not by a ton, but by you know, you know, uh, but you know, between you know, uh, one and, and three and five, depending on the, the the time. But GDP has been slowly shrinking since about 2005, according to his numbers. Now, you know, so who, who knows how honest the numbers, you know, uh, that the government is actually giving us actually are, because they're always monkeying with them and changing them and altering them. Uh, and and so um, you know, are how honest are they? I don't know, but we do know that things are getting harder for those on the lowest end of the scale, those in poverty. We know that things have been getting tougher for the middle class, but in terms of the high end of the scale, the the elite and those on you know the wealthy and those who are in the, have been in the stock market, they've been doing quite well. So, um, you know, it's been a very uneven time. Uh, here in America. And, you know, even Barack Obama and the Democrats, they talk about, oh, income inequality is growing. The gap between the very wealthy and everyone else is increasing. Everyone acknowledges that. And so, you know, that's kind of the situation we're in right now. Now, at some point, things are going to reverse even for the people at the top, because, uh, you know, uh, you know, when when the financial markets hit hard times, which I believe they are, in fact, with the election of Donald Trump, I think that's become far more likely, and, and, and we can uh, talk about why. We know that right now that there's going to be a transition. Uh, Donald Trump is going to be inaugurated in January. He's going to be coming into the White House. He's going to inherit this economy, um, what has been going on around the world. And when he gets everything and you know he looks at it and he hears what's going on, maybe they'll tell him the truth. Maybe he'll they'll sit down with him and say, you know, the economy is not as good as we've said. Do you think that he will be able to turn this economy around? I'm, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that for Donald Trump to be successful, but I am skeptical. And the reason why is this, because under the current situation where, you know, our current system you know, it, the, it's it's we are, we're using a debt based currency. The heart of the system is the Federal Reserve and the system is designed to devalue our currency. And since the Federal Reserve was created, the value of our currency has declined by about 98 percent. It's designed to get us in an endless debt spiral from which there's never any possibly hope of escape. And since the Federal Reserve was, was created, our national debt has gotten more than 5000 times larger. And so Donald Trump's going to be faced with the dilemma. If he wants to continue forward with the current system, well, if he if he wants to try to start living within our means and only spending the money that we take in through taxes, we would instantly go into a depression and then people would blame him and say, oh, you're so horrible, Donald Trump. 
So in order to keep our even our current standard of living, much less improve things, you would have to keep going into debt basically at the rate that we're going into debt right now, um, which would be horrible and would be, uh, you know, be, a, a criminal you know, uh, re regarding future generations of Americans, what we're doing to them is absolutely horrible. So in order to turn things around, th I mean, turning things around, if he wants to monkey with tax rates, if he wants to reduce regulations, all those things are good, but they're just going to have a very small impact on things. I mean, if he really wanted to change things, he needs to uh, uh, fundamentally change the system because the system is fundamentally flawed. And uh, so to fundamentally change the system would involve shutting down the Federal Reserve, going to a debt free form of money and, uh, you know, fundamentally changing things at the foundation. And I, I don't he hasn't talked about that. I'm skeptical that he would be interested in doing that. And so I doubt that that would happen. But that would be in order to fundamentally fix things, you've got to fundamentally change the system. So, you know, he's going to inherit this situation. And maybe he actually believes that he can uh, fix things. But uh, I'm extremely, extremely skeptical at this point. And then the big problem is the reason we've been able to go into so much debt, Dave, is because the rest of the world has been willing to loan us trillions upon trillions of dollars at ultra low interest rates, interest rates which are way below the rate, real rate of inflation, which is it's irrational and irrational bubbles like this don't last forever. But now. Since the election of Donald Trump, what have we already seen start to happen? Uh, the stock market has risen, but the bond market has had problems. And the rest of the world, they don't like Donald Trump so much. You know, China doesn't like him. Europe doesn't like him. You know, Saudi Arabia, they wanted Hillary. So the rest of the world doesn't like Donald Trump so much. So they're saying, well, maybe we're not going to lend the United States uh, all this money at ridiculously low interest rates anymore. So what we've seen is the, uh, you know, uh, rates on 30-year Treasury shoot up dramatically, uh, you know, there for 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 a time right after Donald Trump got got elected. And what happens is because you've got mortgage rates which are, you know, uh, you know, affected by the, you know, the, uh, the, the, that rate. You've got uh, auto loans which are ultimately affected. You've got credit card rates, you've got, uh, you know, student loans. And so when rate, you know, the, the third 30 year mortgage just hit 4% here within the past few days. And so that means when people are shopping for a home, they can afford less of a home. So, uh, you know, that affects the housing market, you know, or people can afford less of a car when they're going out to shop. It affects, ultimately, these interest rates affect everything throughout the economy. So if Donald Trump gets in, relations with the rest of the world don't go well, the rest of the world is kind of sours on lending us money, rates go up, well, that is going to slow down everything. So that's another key factor in why we're not in a rip roaring depression right now because interest rates have been so low. We've been able to borrow all this money at super, super low interest rates that changes and that changes everything. And so um, that's another huge area of concern for me. And another reason why I think we could be looking at a huge economic slowdown while Donald Trump is in the white house. I mean, we're already seeing the effect of interest rates moving up just a tiny bit with the mortgage apps. I mean, they're down quite a bit as the interest rates are moving up a little bit. And we can see the effect already of all of this. And the only reason I'm seeing that and what you're saying too, Mike, is that they're keeping the rates very, very low because of all this debt. They will not be able to support it if they raise interest rates. That's why like Europe and Japan, they're in negative territory already. And, you know, the Fed here continually is talking about raising the interest rates. Do you think they're going to actually raise the interest rates this uh, December? They actually might decide to do that, uh, which would be not a good move. But, uh, you know, so that's that's uh, that's alarming to me because, you know, uh, through you know, and throughout the last several decades, we've seen whenever interest rates go up, economy slows down whenever interest rates are are pushed down the economy tends to do better. Um, and so, and, you know, they've, they've, they've pushed them to the floor, you know, while Obama was president. And then and they were very hesitant to raise them, you know, in, in, in this whole period right before the election, they certainly didn't want to hurt Hillary Clinton's chances. And, but now they're talking about raising them, they might raise them. And, and, uh, and, and there's a whole bunch of factors. There's many people out there that are concerned that the global elite didn't want Donald Trump, obviously. 
and they 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 and they're they're very upset at this point. So there's some out there that are are thinking, hey, once Donald Trump gets in, that they may you know purposely crash the system so that they can blame it on Donald Trump and, and you know and and not only get their revenge but then you know turn the political wins and and things in their favor and for their agenda. So we'll see what happens. I don't know, but yeah, raising rates is is not a good idea at all but uh to a certain extent you know the fed's hands may be forced to a certain degree by the market as as rates raised in the marketplace and so i don't know we'll see you know it's very interesting uh, many people say that he's a complete outsider other people saying no he's not an outsider he's still with the establishment and you said before you know if he doesn't remove the central bank if he goes along with the banks and he doesn't really do that much. Maybe he is an insider pretending to be an outsider. We don't know yet because he hasn't really done anything. He a lot of talk out there. But what's very interesting about all of this is you talked about the crashing of the economy, that they might do it while he's in office. And what's very interesting about Donald Trump is that he's like the king of bankruptcy. Uh, he knows how to handle bankrupt bankruptcy. He knows how to, you know, restructure and this country, you know, has a lot of debt. He deals with a lot of debt and the entire country, if it collapses, it's actually kind of good. Or maybe he, they placed him in the White House to handle the actual collapse. I mean, what, what do you think about that? Uh, it's always possible. I mean, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And, uh, you know, Donald Trump, uh, you know, he definitely appealed to outsiders during the campaign and he and uh you know, and he spoke against, you know, free trade and, and a lot of these other things that are dear to the, the global elite. So, it, you know, it, was he just pretending? Was, you know, I, I, I don't know. I guess time will tell. Time will show us what he really intends to do, what's really in his heart. But, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't think he is an insider, in my opinion. I don't think he is a puppet of the global elite. Um, but I, I could turn out to be wrong. We don't know. But uh, in any event, I am expecting a very chaotic time when Donald Trump is president, not just with economics, but in terms of potentially civil unrest, where we've got, you know, it looks like Donald Trump is going to end up losing the popular vote for a very wide margin. I checked yesterday, the, it, it, the total Hillary's lead was now close to a million votes. And the far left is very, very upset about that. We've already seen, uh, you know, riots and protests in cities all over America. And then they're planning the biggest one of all for January 20th, Inauguration Day in Washington, D.C., which is a, traditionally a time of celebration, the nation coming together, celebrating the new president. But they want to disrupt it as much as possible. They've, uh, you know, this Not My President movement. They've got a hashtag Disrupt J20, which is trending on Twitter and Facebook. And they want to go in, they want to disrupt, they want to force festivities inside, they want to basically do as much as they can to make the point that we don't like Donald Trump, we hate Donald Trump, we're going to fight him every step of the way. And, uh, you know, and of course, Donald Trump has shown that he's kind, kind of got a short fuse. And so this feud, this anger, this frustration, which I believe right now, America is more divided than I've ever seen in my entire lifetime. And it could get a whole lot worse. And my Fear is that we could see civil unrest, riots, protests, anger, frustration boil over. At the same time, we're having economic problems, you know, and this whole thing could just spiral out of control very, very rapidly. So I'm hopeful for good things under Donald Trump, but I also see for the, for the potential for this to go horribly, horribly wrong. Do you think these protests and, and the rioting and stuff, do you think this is all being orchestrated to divide America right now? Well, I believe George Soros and far left organizations are definitely are definitely organizing things, pushing things. So there there is an orchestration, but I also believe that so much of what people are feeling is real. I mean, people out there actually hate Donald Trump. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people do believe that he's essentially the devil and the things that, that they, and they call, you know, they say, oh, it's going to be like living in Nazi Germany. And they use these terms, which evoke emotions in people 
and get people feeling a certain way. And so I believe the anger and frustration are real. Now, the, the those that are attempting to orchestrate things are are using that and fueling that without a doubt. But I also believe that it's tapping into real emotions and how people are really feeling out there. So I, I think that both there's both things going on. So what do you think, like uh, Soros and others, what do, what do you think the end game is? What, I mean, what are they trying to accomplish with all of this? Well, I think that, the uh, you know, Hillary Clinton was supposed to win. You know, the pundits were telling us 80, 90 percent. And so I think the left was lulled into a little bit of a sense of complacency. They didn't think there was any chance Donald Trump was going to win, actually win. So they, they, they didn't like him, but they thought, oh, you know, he's going to be easily defeated. So they were kind of stunned and shocked and surprised that he actually won. And so now they're t they're shifting gears and they want to oppose him and fight him as much as possible. I'm sure they'll try to find some ways to try to impeach him. But with the Republicans in control of the House and Senate, that is going to be kind of far fetched. So I'm sure they'll be trying to bring up whatever scandals they can. They'll be trying to block him however they can in Congress. That they'll be, you know, trying to do whatever they can. But then also, you know, they're going to, you know, try street action, street protest, you know, um, try to, to run. But, but, but basically they want to fight whatever he's trying to do as much as they can, obstruct, slow down, um, and, and keep Donald Trump from accomplishing anything that he's set out to do. So, uh, and, and really, I think the election of Donald Trump is going to be the number one most galvanizing moment for the far left that we've seen in modern American history. So it's going to, it's going to give them motivation. It's just as if, you know, the election of Hillary Clinton would have kind of galvanized the right, but even more, you know, because there's no president that the left has ever hated more than Donald Trump and he's not even in office yet. And so I think this is going to fuel them, fuel their numbers, fuel their passion, fuel their causes. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're going to see some some big things from the from the far left. Do you think their um, ultimate goal is to maybe push a civil war here in America? Well, uh, you know, some people are already t potentially talking about that because they're saying, well, the system has failed us. And uh, even, you know, uh, you know, we've had some celebrities go online here over the past few days and talk about uh, revolution. Uh, let me see if I can uh, find uh, some of these quotes for you, because on, on Twitter, they're actually using the word uh, revolution. And, and let me. Oh, here. Here we go. Let me see if I can find this for you. Um, and it's not just, you know, the rank and file, but it's actually celebrities that are calling for a revolution. Uh, one of them was, um, uh, here we go. Let me see. Let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, I don't think I can. Oh, here it is on Twitter. Katy Perry. She warned quote, the revolution is coming. And this is Katy Perry, one of the biggest pop stars in the world. And then comedian Sarah Silverman said, quote, she she called for quote revolution in the streets. So there, you know, we've got these prominent celebrities that are calling for revolution, revolution in the streets. And of course, people all over Twitter, they're threatening Donald Trump. They're saying that they're going to do this, they're going to do that. So we'll see. I think a big indication of how powerful this movement is going to be is January twentieth, because they've got a couple months. You know, the other day we saw a protest in New York City, twenty five thousand people showed up, basically on the spur of the moment. But I think January 20th, the far left has, uh, you know, two months to organize their forces to say, hey, we're going to descend on Washington, D.C. We're going to protest Donald Trump like no one's ever protested inauguration before. And how big that gets, I think, is going to be an indication of how powerful this movement's going to be moving forward. You know, what's funny about all this, Michael, is that, you know, in the beginning, everyone agreed to the rules. OK, we're going to campaign. I'm not talking about how they campaign, but we're going to campaign. We're going to let the people vote. We understand there's an electoral college and we all agree on this. And, you know, we had the election and everyone thought, like you said, the corporate media, um, the U.S. government, they actually thought, oh, it's in the bag. Hillary won. No problem. And it, they find out that, oh, wait a minute, this is not true. Everything they told us was a complete lie that Hillary's not winning. 
everyone voted the opposite way. And now they don't like the rules. Now they're very upset with the rules. So when we look at all this, they were okay with it when they thought their candidate was going to win. And now that their candidate lost, they're not okay with it. And they're trying to change the Electoral College. Uh, there's petitions out there. I think um, Senator Boxer um, is out there um, creating a bill. Um, I mean, how far do you think they will get to try to change this? Well, I don't think they're going to get very far with their attempt to change the Electoral College. And it's, it would be extremely hard to do because you're dealing with the Constitution. It's not like trying to pass a, a new law. But, um, you know, but and the far left is very upset about all this right now because Hillary Clinton, like I mentioned earlier, she's ahead in the popular vote. And by the time all the votes are counted, it's likely to be well over a million vote difference. But let's, you know, putting the shoe on the other foot, if conservatives were in the same situation and Donald Trump had actually won the popular vote by a very wide margin, but then had lost the electoral college, well, conservatives would be extremely upset too. Um, and, and understandably so. Um, in my opinion, uh, and it, it doesn't have any, you know, even before the election, I was saying, hey, you know, it would make perfect sense to, you know, have every vote count equally and to get rid of the uh, Electoral College and have the American people directly elect the next president. To me, that just makes rational sense. Now, since, uh, you know, a, a Donald Trump won the election by winning the Electoral College, but losing the popular vote, you know, a lot of Trump supporters, you know, don't necessarily want to hear that. And uh, and I'm I'm certainly glad Hillary Clinton is not going to be our next president. So, uh, you know, for for my own personal reasons, if nothing else, and that if she had gotten in, things would not necessarily have gone very well for people like me. Um, so I, I'm glad she's not going to be our next president. But just from a logical, rational point of view, I think it only makes sense to have every vote count the same in the American people to directly elect the president. Um, but now all these conservatives are out there defending the electoral college because that's how Donald Trump won. But ultimately I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense, but I'm certainly pleased with the outcome that Hillary Clinton didn't win. Although I'm not nearly as optimistic as a lot of people out there about what a Trump presidency is actually going to mean. Uh, for the future, I was actually far more concerned about keeping Hillary Clinton from getting into the White House than I was in terms of get, of electing Donald Trump. But uh, so we'll see what happens. But as far as the Electoral College, you know, I think it should be changed, but I don't think it ever will be. Uh, Mike, that's the only place where I disagree with you. Um, and, I, and I wasn't for Trump. I wasn't for Hillary. I was for a person that was going to work with the people, be for the people, not for the central bank, not for corporate interests, not for foreign interests. But I see why we do have the Electoral College, no matter who won. I mean, I don't really, it doesn't make a difference to me because I still feel there's the shadow government, there's the central bank. But going with just the popular vote, um, the reason the founding fathers put this into place is um, one is some type of safety check because the, you can manipulate the votes and they didn't want a candidate going to the popular cities with the population in that city and only going to those individuals and dis and completely disregard the rest of the country. And with manipulation in the voting systems, which actually Bev Harris um, from Hacking Democracy um, shows that you can do this um, where you can manipulate the votes. If we went with the popular vote, it's very easy to manipulate the votes in your favor. Actually, there's a report right now that about 3 million illegals actually voted in this. If you subtract those individuals who are not citizens of the United States, who jumped over the border, who came here illegally, and I have no problem with people coming into the country if they go through the process, but just jumping over the border and saying, okay, I'm in the country. It's like jumping over you know, the turnstile in a football game saying, okay, I'm in the game, I didn't pay, or getting into a movie theater, or anything else where you can say, I made it, too bad about you guys, you had to pay, you had to go through the process, you know, no big deal. But I think that is why they put that into place. And there are states and there are certain, certain regions that, you know, want a say. And if you only, you know, go to New York, if you only go to Dallas, because you know, all right, that's where the majority is. 
I know if I just get this, that will be 51%. The rest will be 50%. So all I have to do is do this, manipulate whatever I need to do in those certain cities. The rest I don't care about. And it's very easy to do. And I think this is what the Democrats and the corporate media and Obama thought. They thought, okay, we have this down. We know we're going to get the popular vote. And hopefully with this popular vote, we will get the Electoral College. Because if you noticed a lot of uh, the laws with the Electoral College, if you don't vote in a certain way, you're fined. So they're kind of forcing them go, to go along with the popular vote, to go along with what is going on. And they kind of knew this. And if you can manipulate it enough, they were hoping that this would all fall into place and go where they want. And actually, if you look back when um, Gore was running, um, they thought, oh, wait, we we have this here also. We have the popular vote once again it's strange how it happened twice and they had the popular vote and bush you know had the electoral he switched i think it was i forgot which state it was it wasn't florida i know florida was part of it but there was another state which he flipped that usually voted in in, in um in a democrat way and it flipped it to a republican but we can see that this happened now twice and this concerns me and i see why the founding fathers put the electoral college there because they were trying to protect and make the voice of the people even across the states. So it's very difficult to manipulate the elections. Yeah, and, and you know, and we've got a voter fraud. We've got, you know, in, in a perfect world, we would have, uh, you know, voter ID in, in every state where you'd have to show identification and prove you're a citizen in, or, in order to vote in all, all all 50 states. And so we've got so many problems and so, so, so much uh, corruption. So there's, there's a, a great deal of, of, uh, you know, things that need to be fixed with our system uh, without yes, a doubt. I agree. I agree but, with you. Uh, you know, before the election, they were saying, you know, hey, you know, it's possible Trump could win the popular vote, but the, the the electoral college seemed to favor the Democrats. And in terms of what Trump had to do, how he, he had to win so many close states in order to have a chance. Now, he ended up running all those states and winning a few extra up in the Rust Belt. Um, and so it really was a, a miracle. But really, uh, you know, uh, those that uh, are supporting Trump kind of forget that really the way the electoral college falls these days, it really uh, appears to give the Democrats an advantage, a built-in advantage. Um, and it, so this could have easily gone the other way. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, and I could very easily see a future election where a Republican won the popular vote, but the Democrats won the Electoral College, and, and that would not be necessarily a, a good outcome. So there's pros and cons. Yes. Um, I, I wanted with, to move on to um, uh, the corporate media and how they're going uh, after alternative news sites. I mean, Google, Facebook, Twitter, the corporate media, they're going after fake news. And uh, they're now putting out lists of, you know, these are the sites that are fake. These are the ones that are real. Don't listen to this. And I mean, because they're, what they're saying right now is that, you know, Trump won because of all this fake news. So I guess my site, um, your site, Zero Hedge, um, activist posts, these would all be considered fake news. What, what do you think about this? And why do you think they're doing this? Yeah, the list that's circulating was put out by some really liberal uh, assistant professor out there who, you know, and she doesn't necessarily represent the, you know, the mainstream media, certainly. Um, and hopefully nobody's listening to her. Uh, but, uh, you know, in terms of, of Google and Facebook saying they want to go after fake news sites, well, if they just go after the fake news sites, and they, they, there are these websites out there that purposely publish fake news stories, and they get they end up getting shared all over Facebook because they kind of sound real, and they say, and, and they're purposely designed to be cut the kind of stories which people go, oh man, that's so shocking. Let me share that, but it is fake, and it's purposely fake, and they're doing it to get clicks and to get traffic and get attention or for other more insidious reasons. So these fake news sites do exist and they are a, a problem. And so if Google and Facebook just go after those fake sites and that's it, you know, that could potentially be a good thing. But now if they say we're going against sites that aren't truthful or not accurate, which they would, you know, translate into, okay, the alternative news sites 
con conservative news sites, patriotic web websites. Um, well, then that's a major problem. And so, you know, could part of the backlash be of a Trump victory that they're going to go after people like us? It's entirely possible, and it's a major concern, and it's something that I'm watching and hoping that does not happen. Um, but uh, we'll see, because, you know, and this is another thing with the division. Instead of the country coming together now, you know, there's so much anger, and you know, and after the election, the, the you know, the, the fighting is continuing. I mean, throughout this election, we've seen this election rip apart uh, families, friends, churches, communities, um, you know, relationships that took decades to build are being divided, are being ripped apart. And so there's so much anger, so much frustration. And now that the election is over, there's a backlash that, you know, conservatives are just, you know, uh, pounding on, on liberals, liberals are pounding on conservatives. Um, so they're, you know, uh, we're divided and it, and it continues to get worse and uh, a house divided against itself will fall. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of conservatives are feeling really good right now because Trump got in, but you know, uh, I don't necessarily see so much reason for optimism. I, I agree with you that um, if we stay divided, this is not going to work. And the, you know, the founding fathers, you know, they've been telling us this all along that, the nation cannot be divided. I, we need to come together. We need to find out who our true enemy is, what the problem really is, and look past, you know, Republican, Democrat, and say, you know something, who's behind the curtain? Who is orchestrating all of this? Why do we have these individuals? And I think we all need to come together um, and stop the protests, the riots, and everything, and try to figure out how we can make this country better how we can remove those individuals like the, um, the central bank, of course, the shadow government, those who are um, big money um, elite individuals that are pulling the strings on certain things going on like George Soros and others. I, I think we need to come together to find out like the, these are the individuals that we need to stop, that we need to say, you know something, you cannot control the government anymore. We need them to be removed. But I, I, at this point, I, I don't see this happening right now at all. Yeah, there's some hope that Donald Trump would come in and drain the swamp and fundamentally change the government, root out a lot of the corruption and a lot of the influence. And um, but, uh, so far, the, the signs I'm seeing and, you know, for example, there is a, there are reports he's considering a a former Goldman Sachs banker to be the treasury secretary. And that's certainly not draining the swamp. Um, so, you know, and concerned with potentially some of his other cabinet appointments that have been, uh, you know, floated so far. So not some, not, not a lot of promising signs so far on that front. And then, you know, of course you mentioned the central bank, the federal reserve, you know, it's not something Donald Trump really even talks about, but that's, you know, at the heart of things. And that's one of the reasons I wrote my the article I did yesterday about, you know, what Donald Trump needs to do. You know, the, my article is entitled Why Donald Trump Must Shut Down the Federal Reserve and Start Issuing Debt-Free Money. And he could do that. You know, President Kennedy did it, started issuing debt-free money. He didn't get rid of the Federal Reserve, but he started issuing debt-free money back in 1963. And Donald Trump could do that. Donald Trump could make these big changes you know he's certainly an outs i believe he's an outsider and he's uh, bold enough and strong enough potentially to make big moves but he's not talking about it right now it's not on his agenda so we'll see you know a, a lot of people are hopeful that donald trump could make some fundamental changes we'll see uh but i'm i'm perhaps less optimistic than some people where do you think we stand with war i mean we were leading up to a world war um, you know, with Russian aggression, Russian aggression, um, everything that's going on in the Middle East, the South China Sea. Where do you see us right now with respect to war? Yeah, if Hillary Clinton would have been elected, well, you know, Vladimir Zirinovsky, he's a, a top Russian politician. He had an interview with Reuters where he openly said, hey, if Hillary Clinton 
is elected, you, you know, you're essentially voting for World War Three. And over in Russia, they they they've been you know they've been preparing like crazy. They just had a civil defense drill involving 40 million people. You know, a a, a news broadcast recently they openly told people, hey, you need to find where your local bomb shelter is in case war breaks out with the United States. So we've been on this trajectory of, of toward war with Russia because of Syria, because of Ukraine, because of everything else. Um, and so that was a major concern. Now, there's hope that now Donald Trump has gotten in, and, and certainly the Russians wanted Trump to get in. There's hope of improved relations with Russia. And so far, there's some promising signs. However, you know, uh, Donald Trump is talking about people like, hey, you know, people like John Bolton for Secretary of State. What? You know, that would he, that would be a major, right. <laughs> major problem, because talk about a, a warmonger. Um you know, and and of course, John McCain's already telling him, hey, you know, you can't get soft on Russia. The Pentagon is very, very anti-Russia at this point, And will Trump listen to the generals? Um, so, you know, a lot of people are hopeful. I'm going to you know, I'm once again, I'm kind of skeptical, uh, you know, because so much of the uh, establishment, the military right now is very anti-Russian will. And Donald Trump has not said he's necessarily pro-Russian. He said, hey, I'd like good relationships with Russia, but we'll see. So we'll see on that front. Now, alternatively, I think this uh, China is already extremely alarmed because who who is the the politician that was toughest on China? It was Donald Trump and and deservedly so because China has been manipulating their currency. They've been cheating us on free trade. They've been uh, stealing our technology. The list goes on and on and on and on. And so Donald Trump has been talking really tough on China. And so China saying, hey, you know, Donald Trump, if you try to do any of this, these things you talked about, we're going to go into a trade war. You know, you're not going to be able to sell your iPhones here. We're going to slap all kinds of tariffs on everything, which they already have. But they said they're going to do it even worse. And so China's gearing up for a trade war. And of course, we still got the situation in the South China Sea. How is that going to be resolved? But I could see uh, relations with China getting a lot worse under Trump because the Chinese, you know, have ha- they've been they've been, uh, you know, having the good end of the game for a long time. And now Donald Trump wants to make things more equitable. And the Chinese are not thrilled about that at all. And they're already very upset with us because of the South China Sea. So I, and and then the concern is. You know, once again, Donald Trump does have a temper. Um, now, of course, Hillary Clinton actually has a worse temper, and and people didn't talk about that much during the election. But she has a horrible temper. But Donald Trump has a temper too. And so, if you know things with Russia, they could be going good for a little bit. But one single thing, and D- Donald Trump could uh, suddenly decide, oh, Russia is on my bad side, or China is on my bad side. And and we've seen how Donald Trump goes after his enemies. And and that doesn't work in the in necessarily in the in the area of international diplomacy. So I could think see things getting worse with China real quickly. And if if things if something happens and Trump decides he doesn't like Russia, things could get a lot worse with Russia too. So I know people are optimistic that maybe the march toward World War Three, you know, is is has been diverted. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't come to that conclusion so quickly. Let's, let's wait and see what happens. Michael, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Yeah, the website I'm primarily known for is theeconomiccollapseblog.com, or if you just go to Google and type in The Economic Collapse, it's the first result that comes up. And then I also have other articles and things that I do. But if people want to find all my writing in a single place, they can go to themostimportantnews.com or just go to Google and type in the most important news. It's the first result that comes up. And then people can find all my books. I've got three books. They can find uh, them all on Amazon.com. Michael, once again, thank you for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Thank you so much. I, I very much enjoyed it. Me too. Kate House, he's going to inherit this economy, um, what has been going on around the world. And when he gets everything and, you know, he looks at it and he hears what's going on, maybe they'll tell him the truth. Maybe he'll, they'll sit down with him and say, you know, the economy is not as good as we've said. Do you think that he will be able to turn this economy around? 
I'm scared. You know, I, I, I'm hopeful that for Donald Trump to be successful, but I am skeptical. And the re reason why is this, because under the current situation where, you know, our current system, you know, it, the, it's, it's, we are, we're using a debt based currency. The heart of the system is the federal reserve and the system is designed to devalue our currency. And since the Federal Reserve was created, the value of our currency has declined by about 98%. It's designed to get us in an endless debt spiral from which there's never any possibly hope of escape. And since the Federal Reserve was, was created, our national debt has gotten more than 5,000 times larger. And so Donald Trump's gonna be faced with the dilemma. If he wants to continue forward with the current system well, if he if he wants to try to start living within our means and only spending the money that we take in through taxes, we would instantly go into a depression and then people would blame him and say, oh, you're so horrible, Donald Trump. So in order to keep our even our current standard of living, much less improve things, you would have to keep going into debt basically at the rate that we're going into debt right now, um, which would be horrible and would be, uh, you know, a, a, a criminal you know, uh, re regarding future generations of Americans, what we're doing to them is absolutely horrible. So in order to turn things around, th I mean, turning things around, if he wants to monkey with tax rates, if he wants to reduce regulations, all those things are good, but they're just going to have a very small impact on things. I mean, if he really wanted to change things, he needs to uh, fundamentally change the system because the system is fundamentally flawed. And uh, so to fundamentally change the system would involve shutting down the Federal Reserve, going to a debt free form of money and, uh, you know, fundamentally changing things at the foundation. And I, I don't he hasn't talked about that. I'm skeptical that he would be interested in doing that. And so I doubt that that would happen. But that would be in order to fundamentally fix things, you've got to fundamentally change the system. So, you know, he's going to inherit this situation. And maybe he actually believes that he can uh, fix things, but uh, I'm extremely, extremely skeptical at this point. And then the big problem is the reason we've been able to go into this, which has been doing better than the rest of the country. Well, the number of people in home, the, the, the number of homeless people in New York City just hit a brand new record high. And so we've got all these, even in this time of, of when things have been fairly steady, the economy's not really been growing. But, uh, you know, things have been relatively stable uh, somewhat, and we can talk about why that is, and I've got some very strong opinions on that. But even during this time of, of relative stability, Dave, we've got poverty exploding, we've got struggles for the middle class, things are getting harder for ordinary Americans and we haven't even gotten into the midst of the, of the n next great crisis yet. You mentioned, you know, why you think this is stable. Uh, what's your view on this? Why do you think the economy is stable throughout this eight years? Yeah. When people say, well, how has Barack Obama stabilized things? Why, why, why aren't we in the middle of a rip-roaring depression right now? Well, the number one factor, and no one ever really talks about this, but the number one factor is debt. And let me give you an example from real life. If you went out today and you went, uh, you know, to a big box store and pulled out your credit card and you could buy a big 70 inch television, bring it home. And then if you could go out and you could go to a car dealership and, and, you know, get the most expensive car you're approved for and go on vacations and, you know, apply for a bunch more credit cards and, and spend money for a while, you could live like a millionaire, but eventually a day of reckoning comes. But for the moment, what you're doing by going into debt, you're bringing future consumption into the present and raising your standard of living. And as a nation, that's what we've been doing. You know, for example, total household debt in the United States at this point is up to $12.3 trillion. The total amount of corporate debt since the last financial crisis has approximately doubled the greatest corporate debt binge in history. But in per, the biggest of all, of course, is the U.S. national debt. When Barack Obama entered the White House, our national debt was sitting at $10.6 trillion. Today, it's sitting at $19.84 trillion, just shy of $20 trillion. So more than $9 trillion, what the federal government has done 
is taken nine trillion dollars from our children our grandchildren future generations of americans stolen all that money which breaks down to more than a hundred million dollars an hour every single hour of every single day since barack obama entered the white house taken all that money from future consumption brought it into the present to make the economy look better now because when the government spends money well that you know that then that and you know goes to pay government contractors, it goes to, you know, pay researchers, it goes to, it has trans so much debt, Dave, is because the rest of the world has been willing to loan us trillions upon trillions of dollars at ultra low interest rates, interest rates, which are way below the rate, real rate of inflation, which is, it's irrational and irrational bubbles like this don't last forever. But now, since the election of Donald Trump, what have we already seen start to happen? Uh, the stock market has risen, but the bond market has had problems. And the rest of the world, they don't like Donald Trump so much. You know, China doesn't like him. Europe doesn't like him. You know, Saudi Arabia, they wanted Hillary. So the rest of the world doesn't like Donald Trump so much. So they're saying, well, maybe we're not going to lend the United States uh, all this money at ridiculously low interest rates anymore. So what we've seen is the, uh, you know, uh, rates on 30 year treasury shoot up dramatically, uh, you know, there for, for, for a time right after Donald Trump got, got elected. And what happens is because you've got mortgage rates, which are, you know, uh, you know, affected by the, you know, the, uh, the, the, that rate, you've got uh, auto loans, which are ultimately affected. You've got credit card rates, you've got, uh, you know, student loans. And so when rate, you know, the, the third 30 year mortgage just hit 4% here within the past few days. And so that means when people are shopping for a home, they can afford less of a home. So, uh, you know, that affects the housing market, you know, or people can afford less of a car when they're going out to shop. It affects, ultimately, these interest rates affect everything throughout the economy. So if Donald Trump gets in, relations with the rest of the world don't go well, the rest of the world is kind of sours on lending us money, rates go up, well, that is going to slow down everything. So that's another key factor in why we're not in a rip-roaring depression right now, because interest rates have been so low. We've been able to borrow this money at super, super low interest rates. That changes, and that changes everything. And so um, that's another huge area of concern for me and another reason why I think we could be looking at a huge economic slowdown while Donald Trump is in the White House. I mean, we're already seeing the effect of interest rates moving up just a tiny bit with the mortgage apps. I mean, they're down quite a bit as the interest rates are moving up a little bit. And we can see the effect already of all of this. And the only reason I'm seeing that, and what you're saying too, Mike, is that they're keeping the rates very, very low because of all this debt. They will not be able to support it if they raise interest rates. That's why like Europe and Japan, they're in negative territory already. And, you know, the Fed here continually is talking about raising the interest rates. Do you think for payments into the pockets of Americans who go out and spend it in the stores? So government spending without a doubt stimulates the economy. But so much of the spending is taken consumption from the future through the through debt, bringing it into the present, making the present look better, because without all that debt that we've gotten into, we would without a doubt, we would be in a horrible economic depression right now. But Barack Obama has essentially cheated and cheated the future because future generations of Americans are going to have to pay back more money than we borrowed because of interest. So he's cheating the future and destroying the future because that's what debt does. It destroys the future to make the present look better. So without all this debt, I wouldn't even want to imagine what our economy would look like. But of course, when you go into all that debt, a day of reckoning comes eventually. From all your data and your research and looking at all these different economic indicators, do you think that we're in a recession right now? Well, uh, John Williams of ShadowStats.com uh, is convinced. You know, he tracks the numbers and he tracks what they would look like if honest numbers were actually being used. And according to his numbers, GDP has been shrinking by and not by a ton, but by you know you know uh, but you know between you know uh, one and and three and five, depending on the, the the time. But GDP has been slowly shrinking since about 2005, according to his numbers. Now you know, so who, who knows how honest the numbers 
you know, uh, that the government is actually giving us actually are because they're always monkeying with them and changing them and altering them. Uh, and and so, um, you know, are how honest are they? I don't know. But we do know that things are getting harder for those on the lowest end of the scale, those in poverty. We know that things have been getting tougher for the middle class. But in terms of the high end of the scale, the the elite and those, uh, you know, the wealthy and those who are in the, have been in the stock market, they've been doing quite well. So, um, you know, it's been a very uneven time uh, here in America. And, e you know, even Barack Obama and the Democrats, they talk about, oh, income inequality is growing. The gap between the very wealthy and everyone else is increasing. Everyone acknowledges that. And so, you know, that's kind of the situation we're in right now. Now, at some point, things are going to reverse even for the people at the top because, uh, you know, uh, you know, when when the financial markets hit hard times, which I believe they are, in fact, with the election of Donald Trump, I think that's become far more likely. And, and, and we can uh, talk about why. We know that right now that there's going to be a transition. Uh, Donald Trump is going to be inaugurated in January. He's going to be coming into the White. We know is at all time highs. And now here we are after the elections. And many people think, well, maybe the economy is fixed. Maybe everything is fine. Maybe we don't have to worry. In your opinion and all your research and everything that you looked at, is the economy OK now? Oh, definitely, definitely not. In fact, our long term problems have gotten even worse. But if you look at it, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, especially Democrats may think, well, Barack Obama did a pretty good job. But when you look at it, he's actually going to be the only president, the only president in all of U.S. history to never have a single year when U.S. GDP grew by at least 3%. And now remember, he's had two terms. So he's had eight years to try to get this done, but not a single year. Every other president, even back during the Great Depression, you know, they had down years, but then they would have up years too. And every single president throughout U.S. history has had at least one year when the economy grew by at least 3%. So we've been in this stagnation period for a while. And, but, but, it's not been stagnation for everyone. You know, the, for example, the people at the very top, they've been doing quite well with the stock market rising, thanks to the Federal Reserve, pumping it up with funny money, the manipulation. So the people at the very top have been doing well. Meanwhile, people in the middle class and at the lower end of the scale have not been doing so well. You know, for example, you look at, uh, you know, there was a survey taken last year, found that 62% of all Americans had less than $1,000 in savings. And then they took the survey again, just here recently this year, and they discovered that number had jumped up from 62% to 69% of all Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. And so what that means is essentially about two thirds of the country is living paycheck to paycheck without a cushion to fall back on. And so that's uh, that's a major concern. You know, we've seen credit card delinquencies. They just hit the highest level that we've seen since 2012 in four years. So people are getting behind on their credit card payments. We're seeing uh, corporations, they're, they're behind on their debts at the highest level since the last financial crisis. We've got CNN has reported that 35% of all Americans have a debt that is at least 180 days past due. So approximately a third of all Americans can't pay all their debts. We've got the rate of home ownership, which is kind of a sign of, of you know, how the middle class is doing. Well, that's fallen for eight years in a row and is now hovering near a 50 year low in terms of the percentage of the country that uh, owns a home. You know what? We've got poverty exploding. In fact, you know, New York City, right where Wall Street is from, where Donald Trump is from, is one of the 